come in a little bit closer. Yeah, just you know. <laughs> come on in, come on in. So, I don't know if you ever get a chance to um, have people kind of tell you about personal things in their life. For me, last night was a blessing, and then I got home. I call Kentucky home now. <laughs> I got home, and then I, I went to sleep right away, woke up this early this morning, and I just had this thing in me that said, you know what, something's not right at home. And uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of tough when you're doing God's work and you know something's not right at home. So I woke up this morning, and I said, I got to call my wife. Now, I have not, I've not seen my wife for about 55 days. She's flying back from China. I'm flying to see the remnant, doing God's work. You know how you do God's work. Woke up this morning, I said, something's not right. And I've got this situation in our house where, where um, I can go on my cell phone and see certain things. So last night, there was a smoke alarm. I called the house. My son's there. I said, hey, what's there doing a smoke alarm? Oh, mom's cooking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then I get up this morning, and, and there's, a, there's a, another sensor goes off. And so I, I called my wife, and I woke up. I said, honey, you're, not, you're just not doing good. I, I saw her one time for a minute. She just does not look right. I said, Andrea, you got to get to urgent care. So I called, um, yeah, I feel emotional. Called my son. Luckily, my son is there. I said to my son, Kyle, you got to wake up. <clears throat> Your mom's got to get to urgent care. And the reason is, is about three weeks ago, she called me from China. And I hear in the background, beep, 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 beep. Well, you know what that means. Somebody's at the hospital. I'm 7,000 miles away. Honey? What's going on? Well, I just couldn't breathe very well. And, and I don't know if you guys know much about China, but it's very polluted in China. My wife has asthma. So it's been a struggle for me to watch her struggle to breathe. So we do everything we can while we're there. Luckily, we got about six months left. Can I get an amen? <laughs> um, I'm so emotional about this. Huh? It's kind of emotional. So... And what's emotional about it is you do the Father's work, and sometimes it's hard with just personal circumstance. So y'all just going to have to, look, it's, you know, I, if I cry, I just cry. Now, I'm going to get to the word. You're going to start crying in a minute. So anyway, this morning, I just, in my spirit, I said, you know what, honey, you got to get to the urgent care. She's like, okay, get my son up, and, you know, and I'm praying. And as I'm praying, I'm preparing for you guys. Because, you know, I am here. The Father has given me a word for you all. I hope that it's, that it's effective. I hope that it gets into your gut, into your heart, into your mind. It changes your life. Then there's the personal side. Now, there was no part of me that wanted to leave. There was no part of me that wanted to go get on the airplane and get back to Charlotte because I knew that the safest and best and most important place to be is in the center of God's will. And I can tell you, I am in the center of God's will tonight. Amen. And because I'm in the center of God's will, sometimes I need him to do me a favor. Can you take care of mama while I'm in the center of God's will? Like, don't let nothing really, really serious happen because then I got to get on an airplane and I'm outside of your will. And you know I don't like flying out of Huntington anyway. So I, I say to her, I talk to my son. He says, okay, Dad. I said, here's the deal. I told your mom, I'm online. I'm looking for which place she can go. They're closed, closed, closed because it's that crazy thing they call Christmas Eve. And I've got to find an urgent care place from Kentucky for my wife who's in Charlotte who just got back from China. And now I'm in Ohio. And so I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find. I find one place. They say, we got one appointment at 1.30. 
but it's the wrong place. I'm back online again, and I find another place. I find the right place, found it for a place at 11.30. I said, I better cancel the one at 1.30 accidentally, canceled the one for 11, and I'm frustrated. I'm back and forth. And, you know, I'm just doing this back and forth. Finally, I get the appointment, call my wife, call my son, and, uh, you know, it's just frustrating to be away. Now, the good news is that Dr. Johnson, I'm Dr. Johnson in our household, I know what the problem is. She doesn't just have gunk. She's probably got like bronchitis. Hopefully it's not walking pneumonia, something like that. She goes to the urgent care. Sure enough, they give her exactly what she needs. And uh, she's at home now with my son and I can get to the word. But the reason I'm telling you this is that we're at a place at BFA right now where I am 100% convinced we need people to pray for what's happening. So, like I say, excuse the tears. You know, it, it's just sincere. Somebody should have given me like a Kleenex or something by now. I'm snotting all over my stuff. Man, the Kentucky, I thought in this tri-state area, you guys were huggers and Kleenex givers, and I ain't had no Kleenex. Ain't no, I ain't sharing your Kleenex. I, ain't, she, I got one for you. <laughs> no, I saw you sneeze on the Kleenex. She ain't gonna want no Kleenex. Amen. Praise God in the highest. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, sister. <laughs> Oh, so, so what I wanted to do before I start, if it's okay, other than cry, is that I want to give you guys a gift. This is one of two gifts I'm going to be giving you guys. I'm going to give you another one tomorrow. I'm trying to preach you down to about 12 people, but every time I think that I got rid of a couple, then a couple more come. So now I don't know if we're going to be able to get you down to 12, but by tomorrow, I'm so excited about tomorrow's message. Never preached before. I've never preached what I'm talking about this weekend at all. But I'm excited about tomorrow because I'm convinced it's in line with what's happening in the time that we're in, in America and the world, and even as it pertains to this thing they call Christmas. So what I want to do is I want to give you something, and this is not an advertisement, it is a request. I want you to put this on your refrigerator. It's a magnet. And all it does is it asks you to pray. That is it. It doesn't ask you for any money. Didn't ask you to do anything. If you could pass that around. I want to make sure that everyone, even if you're a couple, I want everyone in the house to have one of these. Because in times like these, I believe it is crucial that we have people, excuse me, that we have people who are praying. Is there anyone that did not get one? Amen. Okay, thank you. That's four, that's five. We pass that down. My friends over there, did you get one? Hill Billy Annie? Did you? Oh, okay. Excellent. Wow. So, um, I'm going to start the message here in just a minute. Before I start the message, were there any questions from last night? Good. Let's get started. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you think I'm not going to summarize? I'm going to summarize. I'm going to summarize. I'm going to. <laughs> so, for those that have not been here, um, the Father gave me a word, and the word was remnant. And, and oftentimes in our English Bibles, a, a word will be used, but it will use more than one original word in Hebrew or even in Greek. And what I didn't do last night is I didn't give you the words that were behind the English word remnant. We were in Ezra chapter 9, verse 14, where we found two words that were used. I think in uh, Ezra chapter 19, uh, 9, verses 14, um, the two words were actually both used at different times, have both been used at different times in your English Bible, certainly in the NASB, for the word remnant. One of the words is a Hebrew word that in the verse itself, it is phileta, which would be pay, lamed, tet. The other word is she'arit, which would be sheen, resh, uh, no, sheen, aleph, and uh, resh, or sheen, resh, tet, because it's she'arit. Um, both of these words can be used for the word remnant. Um, but what I want to do in this particular section is I have to start off 
with something that is probably going to be something I'm going to have to talk about many more times over the next year or so. And it has to do with a and I don't call out preachers, I don't call out people that do different things that are different than me because I believe that all of us can be used. But about a month and a half ago, I was listening late at night, uh, and oftentimes I'm listening late at night because my wife and I are 12 hours different, so like I'll talk to her at a certain time, it's, she's 12 hours ahead, so I'll be waiting for a call, she'll be waiting for a call. And I don't watch a lot of TV, but for some reason this particular night I turned on the television and I heard this very well-known preacher who said that he was going to be talking about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I was very encouraged. I thought, wow, he's going to talk about rightly uh, you know, dividing the word of truth. And then he said something, you all, that just shook me to my core. He said that if we rightly divide the word of truth, we must divide based on one thing in the Bible. Now, some of you may believe this way, and if you do, I understand, but I'm gonna to explain to you why this particular thinking is dangerous to the people behind the walls of the church. He said, there's only one place of division in the Bible. It's not Old verse Testament versus New Testament. He said is one thing, he said it is at the cross, okay? He said it's at the cross. But he went on to say something that absolutely shocked me. He said that even the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are on the other side of the cross. He went on to say, quote, when Jesus walked the earth, Jesus was on the other side of the cross and everything he did was in that particular side of the cross, which is null and void for us today. He went on to say that everything that happened, even the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which were written on the other side of the cross by history, what they were in an effect were on this side of the cross in application. Now, I'm going to tell you why this is really important and why this is very deep. I happen to not be a person who believes in the idea of Yeshua. There are too many people that love the idea of Jesus, they love the idea of Yeshua, but they don't particularly like his words. I don't know if you know it a lot, there's a lot of preachers in the United States of America today who spend 99% of their time in the epistles. They don't preach much in the gospels and they don't like the big book. The reason they don't preach in the gospels is they think that that Jesus, that Yeshua, his words are just too radical. So when this well-known preacher who's got millions of people in his audience, when they hear that the words that are in red no longer apply to us, everyone says glory to God, hallelujah, amen. I don't have to live by the words of that radical Jesus. It's happening in churches tonight. There are preachers that are standing up tonight talking about the idea of baby Jesus. The theology of the three and a half year Jesus that walked the earth, but we're so glad that all we have to do now is have the idea of him and then everything we do doesn't matter. All those commands by that big bad God, all of those rules and all of those regulations and all of those curses and all of those blessings. We're so glad that all of those have been nailed to the cross except for one. <laughs> all of them except for one. So here's where I am at, you all. I want to talk to you tonight, part two of uh, this message regarding the remnant, I wanna to talk to you about how it is important for us when we're reading the Bible, whether it is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whether it is Judges, 1 Kings, Chronicles, whether it is Acts, Romans, etc., we have got to be able to understand how it matches, how it makes its connection. If it does not connect, we have a real problem. So I want to give you an example of what I mean. In 2002, I, I took a trip over to Israel because I was invited there to experience three things, God's time, God's Torah, and God's tetragrammaton, his name. 
But one of the things that I was really excited about was that I got a chance to be in the old city of Jerusalem, in a part of the old city of Jerusalem that has only been dug up in the last 10, 15, 20 years. It's the south side of the Temple Mount. On the south side of the Temple Mount is the place where people used to come from the city of David through the tunnels, up and through the places and through Holda Gate. And in that particular place is where everyone was also coming at the time of Pentecost. Now, I was invited to be in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, which Methodists call Shavuot. Right? Wrong. <laughs> Methodists call it Pentecost, and the Bible calls it Shavuot. But the beauty of it is that Christians, Jews, and Gentiles agree about this one holiday. They might fight about Passover. They might say that, you know, trumpets doesn't matter, their Sukkot doesn't matter. But we cannot deny this idea of Pentecost slash Shavuot because we need the Holy Ghost. Amen? So we're going to connect on that one. So I spent a lot of time when I was in Jerusalem on the southern side of the Temple Mount were the stairs, the, the original stairs that the people went up to when they had had the mikvah, because there's all sorts of mikvah pools there. If you've ever been to, how many people have been to the southern side of the temple? You said all sorts of mikvah pools. So people would go down into the mikvah and then they would come up and they'd be washed and they'd be clean and they'd go up into the temple and they'd offer their sacrifice. It's a very powerful historic uh, place to be. In fact, tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that we're doing a trip to, uh, to Israel and I don't even know if this is even possible, but we're actually doing what we call the Red Letter Study Tour, where we're actually going to look at language, history, and context of what I think are the most important words that have ever been written. Amen. So, back to this time that I'm spending at Shavuot. There was a really important thing that happened there, and it has to do with this man named Peter. Do you ever heard about the man named Peter? He preached a really good sermon. They say he was a really good preacher. But before Peter ever preached this sermon, he hung out with this guy named Yeshua. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think if Yeshua lived in the United States, he would hang out in the tri-state region. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why I think Yeshua would hang out in the tri-state region because he understood about the remnant. Last night, if you weren't here, we talked about the remnant being the words for both fugitive and survivor. There's a lot of fugitives in Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia. There's a lot of survivors in Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia. And the reason that I think that he would be here is that I'm sure that if there was like a prepper meeting, they would invite Yeshua there because I believe Yeshua was a prepper. I've never said this before, but I'm going to say it here in the tri-state region. I believe that Yeshua was a prepper. How many people know about preppers? Oh, Lord have mercy. I knew I got the right thing here. <laughs> the preppers have this attitude where they're always preparing for something that might not go right. They start guessing about when, where, and how. And one of the things about Yeshua, and I, I'm just in case you guys, anyone gets nervous about this, I want to prove to you that Yeshua was a prepper. Open your Bibles to the book that was done away with before the cross. <laughs> Matthew. The book of Matthew. I happen to love the book of Matthew. I'm doing a study in the book of Matthew uh, right now. Uh, actually, we're, um, Nehemiah and I are working on, uh, he doesn't know that I call it this, it's called the Hebrew Matthew Project. And the Hebrew Matthew Project <laughs> that we're working on is using more of the manuscripts that have been available. He's done an awesome job, some 27, 28 manuscripts that Nehemiah has been uh, uh, gathering, and he's uh, agreed to have me help him as it pertains to being like the person that reads after he puts something together. So I'm like the editor of the Hebrew Matthew Project. And so I'm all excited about this. We've gated through 14 chapters of the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And so I'm telling you guys this right now so you can put some pressure on him. Because after 14 chapters, he stopped. And I need somebody who's got an end to Nehemiah to call him up and say, we heard that you have stopped the Hebrew Matthew project. Get back in gear. We need the entire book of Matthew where we can read it in Hebrew as it was originally written. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. It's a powerful study. And actually, I'm doing a study now. I've uh, just finished, uh, I think it was um, 16 or some uh, uh, episodes on the Red Letter series. We made it up to uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. You can go to BFA. Oh, it's not there. 
bfainternational.com, and you can actually go and, uh, and listen to those, those, uh, those teachings on the uh, Red Letter Study, uh, on Red Letter Study, Red Letter Studies, I was called. I'm going to get myself together here in a minute. Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus, reading from my Methodist Bible, and Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, and he answered and said to them, Do you not see these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you actually can go to the corner of the southern and the western walls and you can actually see stones that fell down to the actual area where the sidewalk has been damaged by those stones that were thrown down by the Romans. That exists today. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, another great place to go, by the way, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will all these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? What shall we do as preppers? Say preppers. He said to them, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will lead many, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. Nation will rise against nation, but all these things will take place. And he goes on to talk about them. Then he goes on and he has a shift in verse 15. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, it's very interesting. He doesn't say this. Now, those in Judea should get on their knees and pray. He says those in Judea should know what's coming, be prepared for what's coming, and they should get out of town. He goes on to say, let the one who is on the housetop not go down to get the things that are in his house. Let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babies in those days. But pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. He doesn't say pray that you will not have a flight. Pray that when the flight comes and it is coming, that it will not be in difficult times where it's like cold and it's snowing or it's on the Sabbath. For there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. And unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. And he goes on to talk for the next few chapters about what's going to happen in the end. Why do I call him a prepper? Because he's not saying to, to the people, don't worry about it. He's not saying God's got it. Even though he believes that God has it, he's saying, listen, when this happens, be prepared for it and be prepared to act in a way that will save you. Now, you all, here's where I'm going to get in a little bit of trouble tonight. There is a difference in scripture between spiritual salvation and physical salvation. You have to know when someone is talking about spiritual salvation versus physical salvation. You see, the preppers understand about the spiritual stuff, but what I really love about the preppers, they know that, hey, if that thing changes out there, you better find your way to get your way to wherever you got to get to. You better make sure you've got food to be able to eat. You better make sure you have water to be able to drink. You better be sure that your transportation works. They just understand. It's almost as if they've read the words of the radical Jesus that says that if this time comes, you better be prepared. Now, like I say, I, I like to talk about good news. I like to talk about good things. But sometimes, you all, we've got to read the Bible with what I call reality with our eyelids, with our eyeballs. We're actually looking at it, and we're asking the question, what does this mean for us? So now to this man named Peter. He hung out with Yeshua for how long? He was a disciple, right? I mean, he was kind of a pretty important disciple. He understood. He was there when he preached about this. And there's something that happens, you all, in Acts 
chapter 2 that I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I figured since I'm here amongst the remnant and we're at the in-between message, like yesterday it was like the introduction and tomorrow is the big kahuna. Right now we're at the in-between time where we can kind of be uncomfortable. Can I share a passage with you that makes me just a little uncomfortable? Is that okay? Raise your hand if it's not okay. It's okay? okay. Amen. I want you guys to turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, we have a story of Peter, remember, one of the great disciples, preaching a big sermon. And when Peter is preaching this sermon, I can guarantee you, you all probably know much about what he preached. It's a long sermon. But he does something really interesting that I only hear people talk about the first half of it, not the whole of it. It is in Acts chapter 2, verse 21. He's getting excited, he's talking, and he's, he's doing what he does, and then he says this really radical verse that the preacher who says that there's the word before the cross and the word after the cross is going to have a little problem with this is because Peter does this really, really radical thing. Peter's at the temple, and he starts preaching, and he's using the big book, which is supposed to be the book that's null and void. Uh 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 Now, that preacher probably doesn't know. There's probably about 80% of the New Testament from the big book. That leaves us with about 10, 20, what is that? 20% that's not? So then there's only like 20% of the book that is still good for us today? I don't know what he was talking about. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. You guys know it from heart. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I am not big into telling people how you're supposed to pronounce the name because I believe that in the end we're going to find out what the pronunciation is. However, I am huge on helping people understand the significance of the name, the power of the name, the importance of the name, the way that the name is testified to, the way that we can have the name used in our life in ways that are just profound. It is not too holy to pronounce. It is not too profound to understand. It is God's name that he is making known all over the world today. It is so exciting. I have to tell you something. It is so exciting. I'm going to tell you guys a personal story. I should almost have the recording cut off, but you can keep it on. So I told, uh, I told my friend Jen this. In 2002, when I went to Israel, Nehemiah and I were across from the place where God placed his name forever. And as we were sitting across the place where God placed his name forever, I asked Nehemiah a question I had asked many Jewish people, and they always gave me the same answer. Every single Jewish person I asked always said, well, that name is too holy to pronounce, too, prof- too profound to understand, too powerful for you Gentiles to even deal with. So I asked Nehemiah the question. I said, do you know anything about the name? He says, do you have a piece of paper and pencil? I said, yeah, I got a piece of paper and pencil. He said, well, write down these four letters. Yud, hey, vav, hey. And I wrote the four letters down. I remembered it from seminary. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I went to Greek and I did Hebrew. So I thought, yeah, I know a little bit of Hebrew. I write those right down. And he says, uh, now, do you know anything about the vowels? And of course, I had to say yes, but I didn't really know too much about the vowels. So he writes the vowels down and he says, according to the oldest, most complete Hebrew manuscript, this is how the name would be pronounced. When Nehemiah pronounces the name, there's a man standing right next to us with a prayer shawl and a huge shofar, and he blows the shofar two times. Even Nehemiah, some years ago, he still will tell you he remembers the story. It shocked both of us. This guy is just standing next to us. Nehemiah speaks the name, and we hear, can I tell you what we heard? I'll show you what we heard. Tell us the shofar. I don't know if this shofar can do what my shofar can do, can it? I'm going to show you just kind of what the sound was. So Nehemiah says, according to the oldest, most complete Hebrew manuscripts, the name would be Yehovah. And they hear this. And when I hear this sound, something happens in my spirit. I want to recreate that sound. I want to find out what that instrument was had. I want to find out how I can play this sound again. So I end up calling some people in Texas who have shofars, and I get my first shofar, and my family laughs about this. The first time I blew it, they went, oh, Lord. (laughs) Now they ask me, 
to blow the shofar, the sound of the shofar. You know what I love about the sound of the shofar? is not just the sound, but what is physically taking place when you blow it. You know this thing, this shofar, used to be this, right? Y'all know this. <laughs> and what's amazing about it is that inside of it is flesh. Uh -huh. So in order to get the sound, you have to remove the old, dead flesh. Right. And then the ruach, <laughs> the ruach goes through the wind. And as a result, our ears hear this amazing sound. I kept trying to recreate the sound, and now I, I feel like I've recreated that sound. So when Peter is talking, he says, those who call upon the name shall be saved. And all over America and even most churches in the world stop right there. Even Peter stopped right there. Most of you here could probably say that verse from memory. Go ahead and say it. Say the verse that Peter said. Say it again. So however you pronounce it, he says those who call upon the name, he didn't say yud heh vav -Hey. In that situation, at least we don't know that he did. Though what we understand, oh, she's looking at her Bible. I like that. Jen's looking at her Bible. <laughs> She's checking to say, now, did he say, Yehovah, did he say, what he says is, uh, check with me now, uh, uh, let's check, you got your Bible, to, uh, you got your Bible back there? I think what it says, if I'm right or wrong, I, I hope I'm right on this. Oh, you, who, what, what does yours say? say? Say it again. What kind of Bible you have? Here's what mine says in my Methodist Bible. And it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the L-O-R-D shall be saved. So I guess he did say something. I can guarantee you what he didn't say. He didn't use the King James English when he spoke on the southern side of the temple. I can guarantee you this. He did not say those who call on the name Lord. I'll tell you that he didn't say that. My argument would be, according to what we understand that Yeshua did, even in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, is he proclaimed his father's name over and over and over again. I think his disciples probably followed his example. But here's what catches my attention for the remnant. People know the first part of the verse, but they don't know the second part of the verse. Did you know that Peter is actually preaching a verse that stops right in the middle of the verse? I bet you no one here has memorized the second part of the verse that Peter's preaching from. I didn't even know that it was there until I did a radical thing. I opened my Bible. Can we do that? Go to the part of the Bible that the preacher says is no good anymore, that actually Peter is preaching on on the other side of the cross, that obviously for Peter, that was a pretty good passage to go to. Can we do that right now? Okay, turn with me, if you will, to Joel... Chapter 3, verse 5. Joel, chapter 3, verse 5. In the English, it's going to be chapter 2, verses 32. But in the English, it is 3, verse 5. I think it's 3, verse 5 in the English. I might have it switched around. 2.33, I'm sorry, in, in, the Hebrew, in, the, in the Hebrew, it's different. Okay, here we go. Um, Joel chapter 2. 32, you guys are trying to mess around with me, aren't you? I know what you guys are doing. I'm in the tri-state area where they throw curveballs at people. Here's what it says in Joel chapter 32. And it will come about that whoever calls upon the name of the L-O-R-D. Now, here's what we love to do. Can we stop there for a second? What we want to do is we want to open this book. Why do we want to open this book? This book is going to give us that which Yeshua and Peter and Paul and every writer of the New Testament understood to be the oracles of God, the word of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something really radical. If anyone can find this, it would be this part of the country that could find it. Do you know that you're not going to find one time in the New Testament where it says, thus saith the Lord? Can I say that again? 
You got cameras on back there. I'm going to get in trouble. I might as well get in trouble in the right part of the country. There's no place in the little book where it says, where it says thus saith the Lord. Now, let me tell you why that is. Paul, Peter, James, every single person in the New Testament never thought at the time that they were writing that they were writing as Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Never once did they think that. Now, here's the power of that. You've got people who understood this to be, as Paul says, the oracles of God. All scripture is God-breathed, he says. It's inspired. Now, when Paul wrote that, there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and letters to Rome, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. He was talking about this book. Everything he's writing about has to match this book. Now, the preacher says, hey, y'all, don't worry about that book. All you got to worry about is anything on the other side of the cross that's not related to. Does that a problem for anyone else like it is a problem for me? I find that to be a huge problem. Now, here's the point. If we open up this book, we find out that Joel chapter 2 says they will call upon the name Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, those are the four letters of God's personal name 6,828 times in the Leningrad, 6,827 times in the Aleppo Codex, and sometimes say sometimes. We find that the name with four consonants ends up with three vowels, which gives us seven different markings that come together with a beautiful proclamation of his name. Now, in Joel chapter 2, we don't find it that way. We find it with four, vowel, four consonants and two vowels so that you would not proclaim it. The point is this. There is no question that when Peter is preaching this and when it was given in Joel that they were proclaiming the name of our Heavenly Father. Here's the part I love. The second part of the verse. We're still in Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and here's what it says for the remnant. And it shall come about that whoever calls upon the name of yud heh vav heh Yehovah in some of the uh, manuscripts that we have, other people use other pronunciations, it says, and it will come about that whoever calls upon the name Yehovah shall be, and then here's the word, delivered in your English Bible. Saved, I think, in the New Testament. People looking at you, what you'd have to do is you'd have to look at the Tanakh and the Hebrew and say, what's the Hebrew word? And then in Greek, what would be the Greek word? It's a wonderful study for you, but I want to continue. Say continue. continue. Here's the second part that nobody really, many people have uh, memorized. For on, and can I tell you why they don't have this part memorized? Because we end up hearing so often the New Testament stories in the church Here's what happens in the Jewish community. They don't know anything about any New Testament stories. What they hear over and over every single week, year after year after year, is the Torah. Say the Torah. Torah. They read portions of the Torah every single week. My friends, rabbis, uh, people that are on the street, they can tell me different passages because they've heard it over and over. They can, they can, they can have different passages memorized that are in their minds because they heard them since they were little teeny children all the way until they're adults, those that are in the synagogue. But we don't actually hear those things. What we hear are these sorts of passages. And it will come about that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord in English will be, and then in Joel says, delivered, not saved. Somebody say, uh-oh. uh-oh. Why does he say delivered? Here's what it says. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the survivals, the survivors of whom the Lord calls. Now, I'm going to tell you what I love for people to do. When you're reading a passage, always make sure you check the context. There are 30,000 denominations of Christianity, and most of them are based on one verse. We believe in pre trip We believe in post-trip. We believe in this. We believe in that. We believe in women with hair covers. We believe in women without hair covers. We believe in that you can have it. And over and over and over again, 30,000 denominations that pick a verse and say, we stand by this verse. It is the word of God. But did you read the context? If we read the context, we find out something really powerful. 
The very words in Ezra chapter 9, verse 14 for remnant, when I told you it was pe, lamed, tet, that same word is used in Joel. Speaking about the deliverance of the remnant. Here's the good news. The context says this. Keith, why do you make such a big deal about knowing the name of God? Why do you make such a big deal about that? I mean, come on, it's really not an issue of salvation. I will tell you that it is, depending on what salvation you're looking at. If you were talking about a spiritual salvation, you might be right. But if you're talking about a physical salvation, I know that the Bible tells me this. If I run into his name, I will be saved. Joel chapter 2 is talking about a physical deliverance. That's a prepper verse. In other words, when we understand God's name, what Peter was saying, he, and here's why Peter could give half the verse. Peter could give half the verse because the people that he's speaking to know the whole verse. Can I say that again? Peter can give half the verse because the people he's preaching to know the whole verse. But what happens in the church? We've got preachers that are saying, yeah, we love the idea of Jesus, but we like to stay away from his words. We love what Paul preaches about, but we don't want to understand what Paul really understands. We love this whole idea of Christianity that says I can live like hell six days a week as long as I live like heaven on one. If, if I just make it to the altar and bow my knee and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for acting disgusted, busted, and can't be trusted, but if you'll just give me grace today, I can get up and act a fool for the rest of the week. That is not what Jesus, Yeshua, taught. If you love my father, you're going to do what my father said to do. So you guys are called the radical ones, the fugitives, the survivors, the remnant. The same exact English word remnant that we find in the Bible is actually three different Hebrew words. I'll tell you that one tomorrow. But I'm excited, you guys, because right now there's something happening around the world. You know what's happening around the world? The remnant is becoming awake. It's as if the father is whistling. <laughs> and ears are perking up all over the world. Now, I've got this gift I want to give to the remnant tomorrow. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm preaching you guys down that some of y'all just going to stay home and you're saying, you know what, that guy's too radical. What do you mean just the idea of Jesus? I love the idea of Yeshua. What do you mean I want supposed to live by what he said? Absolutely, you must live by what he said. You know what he said. You want to talk about the cross? If you're going to follow me, you better take up that thing every single day, even on to death. That's why this morning, when I wake up and I say, Father, I'm going to do what you say to do, how you say to do it, when you say to do it, why you say to do it, even if it means it's going to cause me to cry in front of the remnant, I am going to be obedient to you because you gave me a word, and I want to live by your word. I want to do your word. I want to act your word, even when it's tough, even when it's difficult, even when it hurts, I want to be in the center of your perfect will. I came here looking for the remnant. I came here looking for the remnant. The remnant, your fugitives, oh, I can, I can read your mail. Some of you here, I'm telling you, you make it into this room and you see me crying, you say, boy, I wish I could cry about what I'm going back to tonight. Some of you live lonely lives. Some of you live lives where there are people that are close to you that think you are absolutely nuts, that you ain't got your Santa Claus hat on tonight, and you're not baking cookies with the children, and you didn't buy any presents for Aunt Sally. Then you know, some of you are thinking, man, praise God, I can escape. Praise God, I can be a fugitive. And praise God, I can be a survivor. But boy, they're waiting for me tomorrow. Well, have you gotten enough of them crazy messianics? Are you going to be at the Christmas dinner or not? <laughs> Some of you are probably going to decide, I don't know if I suggest it. Some of you are going to decide you want all three messages. Some of you are actually going to get in your car and probably, I bet I'm going to have at least two. <laughs> I think these two here will be here. And maybe my new friend, the Donald, 
I don't know if the Donald and Desiree, I don't know. The Donald, well, I got four. I got four. I'm hoping I got four. And the Kentuckians got to come because I'm in their car. They got to come. So I know that I've got six tomorrow. That eight, the sound man say I got to be here. And since the sound man's coming, mama says, I'm not sending you alone. I got eight. Now, if I could go I, two more, nine, 10, 11, 12? I, oh, the whole family? Oh, Lord. Somebody say we're about to have revival. Revival tomorrow night, you guys. Listen, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And, and please forgive me for my tears. My tears are because I love my family. And you know what my wife told some people in China? This is a funny story. This, this lady's sitting down with my wife, and we're in China, and we're having dinner. And she says, you know, she's single. And she says, what our pastor teaches is you better be sure that you have a man that loves you more than anything. And my wife said, you know, my husband loves me more than anything. But she said, you know what? I think you need a man who loves God more than he loves you. Amen. And I was a little embarrassed. I'm like, honey, don't say that. But you know, and it, she, she said to me, my husband really loves me. But you know what? He loves God even more than he loves me. Now, here's the secret to my wife. Because I love God so much, I love her. There was this radical man named Jesus, Yeshua. They asked him a question on this side of the cross. They said, Yeshua, before you die, and we love the idea of you, before you die and you get on the cross, what's the most important command in the big book? And, you know, sometimes I say, you know, he should have stopped with the first thing. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your... And he didn't say, Lord, your God. You should love Adonai. He didn't say Adonai. <laughs> you should love Hashem. He didn't say Hashem. He said, you should love Yehovah, your God, your Elohim, with all of your heart, with all of your soul. And then he does this really cool thing in Hebrew. He says, you should love him with all of your me'od. Me'od is used in this way. Come on, look at I got some pre. What does it say? Very, your very. Oh, your very, every, 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 everything that you have. And then he, he should have stopped right there because we got that part down. We love God. We love God. I mean, the movement, there's so many people say, I'll give you everything, but boy, don't make me have to love that neighbor of mine. I don't like the neighbor. You know what's really sad in the Messianic movement? You know what's really sad in the Messianic movement? You see people that say they love God, but they hate some people in their fellowship. In their own fellowship. They don't understand. Yeshua said, look, what's the most important thing? They're connected. You love God and you love your neighbor. Funny thing, before I got a part of this movement, I graduated from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, I would have got up and preached and said, you know, we thank God for Jesus having the ability to go beyond the words of God, to use part of the Torah and say you shall love the God, Lord your God in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And then Jesus came up with this really radical idea that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Come to find out that loving your neighbor at, comes from a part of the same book as loving God. <laughs> In one of the most radical parts of the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, help me, chapter 19, it says, from that mean old God, love your neighbor. You know, I'm going to tell you something about the Torah. It's a love letter. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim et haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth for you. And you. And you. And you, he created it for us. He created us. Those husbands that are here today, don't you know what happened when after God created man? You know what he did? He created man and told man, okay, now it's time for me to find someone that's going to help you. No, I'm going to have to find someone that can walk side by side with you. So God did a funny thing. <laughs> he brought all the animals. Let Adam name the animals. And there was no helper. Of course there was no helper. You know what God had to do? He had to put Adam to sleep. Because if he didn't put Adam to sleep, Adam was going to tell God how to create his helpmate. <laughs> Can I get an amen, sisters? <laughs> and so when he put Adam to sleep, 
God went to his side and said, I'm going to take from you and not make you the way I made you. You old man, I gave you from dirt. I, you came from the dirt of the earth. But when it was time for me to make woman, I built her. Come on, somebody. She didn't come from the dirt like you. She was built by my hands. And when he brought, can I say this now? When he brought the woman to Adam, he could only say one thing. Whoa! <laughs> now that's if I was preaching in English, but in Hebrew, it's not that way. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna close you guys with this, this idea. We should be celebrating tonight. Some people saying we're missing the party. They're saying we're missing the party. I'm going to tell you guys tomorrow, I'm going to give you a testimony. It's such an important testimony about this day that they call Christmas based on the land, language, history of the book. I want to give you that testimony. But more than that, I have a message that I really do want you to be in prayer for us tonight. Because tomorrow I'm going to share with you a message that I, I've read the Bible through. I don't know how many times I've read the Bible through. But it wasn't until I was preparing for you guys that this verse, this passage came to me. So I know it is for you. So my challenge for you tonight is to consider yourself a part of the remnant, not the English word remnant, but the Hebrew words. You're a fugitive. You're an escapee. You're a survivor. And because of that, the father is going to do some amazing things. He's going to tell you ahead of time. He's going to tell you ahead of time. Now, I'm going to tell you something, you all. You have a very big responsibility because you know what's going to happen probably in our lifetime? The world's going to turn to you and say, okay, tell me about this God. Tell me about this God who you follow his word. Tell me about this God who tells you what time it is. Tell me about this God who has a name because I cannot find an answer in my denomination. I cannot find an answer from the rabbis. I cannot find an answer from every Tom, Dick, and Harry who comes up with a new spiritual idea. I need the creator of the universe who had me in mind during this time. I need his deliverance. Yes. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. As difficult as it is for us to dive in and dig in and shake some things up, help us to be challenged even in our way of thinking about you. Mold us and shape us. Father, I ask for your grace for my family. I ask for the grace of the family of those that are here tonight and even those that will hear this in the future maybe. That you will continue to love us in the midst of struggle You'll continue to speak to us in the midst of trial. You'll hold us when we're lonely. You'll build us up and break us down if you need to. But in all of it, we pray that you would keep us in your will. We thank you so much for the prepper, Yeshua, Jesus, who told them what would happen and how to prepare. We thank you for the book that's preached throughout the little book, the New Testament. And if we could just read the context, we could be so blessed to be able to understand your word in its original language, history, and context. May it be for those that are here tonight and for those that they will share with in the future. We pray for tomorrow during this time, this season, that is really um, a time of darkness and not a time of light. We pray that we would be the light. And in the end, we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. And everybody said together, in his name, amen. I want to ask you guys. Oh, you guys are so good, you guys. Man, I'm telling you, man, I want to come back here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, only time, only time, the next time I come back here, I don't want to be the preacher. I just want to sit and listen to you guys. I mean, I'm telling you. Uh, let me tell you what's happening. I have to make this. I want to. <laughs> He got that Tennessee head, and I still like him. <laughs> my, son, my son went to Clemson, national champions last year. Uh, Maybe this year again, too. You think so? I didn't know Alabama fans in here, are there? No. No, okay. Anyway, um, I told them that, that I did something, you guys. Um, I, what excites me more than anything is to study the Bible. Um, and when I say to study the Bible, is I don't mean to study the Bible as an intellectual uh, exercise, I mean study the Bible assuming that it is the living word of God. 
And when I'm studying the Bible as a living word of God, there's things that happen to me. So I had an, a conference this last year. My friends back there were at this conference. It was called the Return to the Book Conference. And there was really one presentation that I did that I was so excited about. It was called Six Universal Questions That Must Be Answered About the Book. In the end, it's two and a half hours with a PowerPoint slide of 100 slides. And I did this presentation live, but my purpose for doing it was to make it available to the world. And we have people around the world that were waiting for what happened at the return to the book conference. I have good news. The good news, after much struggle, we are so close to having, well, actually, I now have in my possession five of the presentations from the return to the book conference. And if, if God says the same and everything is done that needs to be done between now and the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, that conference is going to be made available to the world. And I really, really want to invite you all to make sure that you sign up for the newsletter because we're going to announce when it's available. Another thing I want to tell you about is that um, this conference called Return to the Book Conference, I did a really radical thing. I invited the grandson of Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Eliezer Ben Yehuda in some 1800s. Are you guys still have a few minutes? I don't want to check. What time is it? Is, we, what time? What? We're off, right? What time is it? Quarter what? That's all? Lord, have mercy. Are you kidding me? I thought I was up here for so long, I could take my time. So, I mean, I, I, my friend's coming up here. I mean, am I all right? Okay. So I want to tell you what happened. In the late 1800s, there was a man who had a vision to bring the Hebrew language back to life. Uh, and his name was Eliezer ben Yehuda. And he had a wife. And he and his wife moved to Israel. And when he got to Israel and got off the boat... He told his wife, my dear, from this day forward, I will not speak to you in any other language than Hebrew. Now, he happened to be a man that was studying Hebrew. He is studying it from an intellectual standpoint. But what he knew, he must have known Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, or some of the other verses that say that in the last day they will all speak a pure language. Because what he did is he began to build a repertoire, a curriculum for taking biblical Hebrew and putting it in modern terms. What do you mean by this? There are certain words that are in our language today that are not in the Bible, but there are smells like ideas of what's in the Bible that could be used for modern terms. For example, there is no term for uh, pistol. So what did he do? He went to David, who used a sling to shoot at Goliath and took that biblical term and used it for a modern term, which would mean pistol. Do you understand? There are also many biblical terms. If you speak uh, modern Hebrew today, one of the things I decided to do in my Hebrew language is that I, I decided I would not learn modern Hebrew until I learned biblical Hebrew. What I decided to do was do not teach me any modern Hebrew. Just teach me biblical Hebrew because biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew are, are not the same. The grammar is not the same. It's not the same uh, situation. You have many modern words that you do not find in the Bible. But what Eliezer ben Yehuda did is he had it on his heart. He had a vision to bring back biblical Hebrew in modern times. Now, in the history of the world, there's never been a language that died that was resurrected except one. Has a dead language come back to life except for this one? This man got to Israel. He started with his wife, the first son that was born, he told his wife, you do not speak to our son in anything other than Hebrew. For the first three years, all the neighbors thought that the child was retarded because he didn't speak. One day, the boy was crying. He was crying uncontrollably, and the mother, who was from Russia, began to sing him a Russian lullaby. As she's singing the Russian lullaby, the boy begins to quiet down. Just as she's singing, Father Eliezer ben Yehuda comes in and hears his wife speaking Russian to the child and he goes through the roof. He says, what are you doing? You have ruined everything I've done. And the little boy said, die, baba, die, which means enough. <laughs> in Hebrew, for three years, the little boy was learning the language. And as a result, that little boy, then they had a daughter, the daughter and the son, Together, they were out in the streets. They were speaking. They didn't, the other kids were making fun of them, and so he gave them a dog and a cat. And the cat 
they spoke to as a female, and the dog they spoke to in the male. And one time the little boy was outside speaking Hebrew to the dog, and the little children that were, were you know, the children of the rabbis heard the holy tongue being spoken to a dog, and they killed the dog. This was a challenge over and over again, but guess what happened? After a while, more and more people started wanting to know about the Hebrew language. More and more people. Pretty soon, he created a newspaper where he would put Hebrew terms every single week. Says, hey, these are the ones you got to learn because next week here comes some new ones. Pretty soon, he created an entire curriculum of the Hebrew language. By 1926, the Hebrew language became one of three official languages in the state of Israel. If Hebrew would not have been the language, Israel would not have been able to exist today. Why? Because you had some 70 or 80 different languages being spoken. Guess what language they originally wanted the Israelis to speak? Arabic. No. German. German. Can you imagine if German would have been the language and then the Holocaust happens? So here God used this man named Eliezer ben Yehuda to re resurrect the Hebrew language. He died on Hanukkah 1926 or so. He ended up having several uh, 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 children. His first wife died. He had a second wife. And of her, they had a son. And his name is, El his name is Eliezer ben Yehuda, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yehuda. I actually reached out to him, went and spoke to him in Florida, did an interview with him about this topic, Torah versus law. We call it law. The Bible calls it Torah. Why? He did an interview. At the end of the interview, he looked at me and said, anytime you ask me, wherever you ask me to go, I will go. I thought, I'm not asking you to go anywhere. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to ask you. Sure enough, God says, like, that's the man you got to bring to Charlotte. Why do you want to bring him to Charlotte? Because together, we're going to come together and do a conference called Return to the Book. And together, Rabbi Eliezer and I did this. Just this week, he sends me a note, says, brother, where are those videos? I said, they're coming. I got to go deal with the remnant. I can't deal with them until I go deal with the remnant. But when I get back, somebody say, when I get back, when I get back. if all goes well by tomorrow, because I, I forgot to tell you something, you guys. <laughs> Last thing. Actually, tomorrow, you guys are actually going to help launch what's coming next. Look at your neighbor and say, goody. Goody. No, no, I mean, no, this is exciting, you guys. The world is going to hear about what happened in the tri-state area. Why do they call it the tri-state again? Because it's three places. Three, three. Do they say which one's first? Ohio. <laughs> is that what they say? Is they say it's Ohio? <laughs> I bet the West Virginians don't think that way. <laughs> so listen. Folks, here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to thank you guys for, I, I, I don't cry unless I feel comfortable. And so I, I cried at the conference over with my son. I felt comfortable. I saw my friends there. And I don't cry all the time. Now, Hamia cries all the time. I don't cry all the time. <laughs> so uh, I do want to give a chance tonight uh, for anybody that has a question or a comment. Um, because um, if you do have questions or comments, I'll try my best to uh, refer them to my in-house scholar. But uh, if you have a question for me personally, even if it's personal, I, I would be glad to answer it. Does anyone have a question or a comment up to this point of anything I've said, anything I've talked about, anything you think? Anyone? Hmm? Say it again. But wait, but see, I'm afraid if I tell you, you won't come. Will you be here tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, so don't worry about it. Is anyone else concerned about tomorrow? <laughs> no, 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 because I'll tell you, well, I don't need to hear that. I already know that. <laughs> no, I'm excited about tomorrow. I'm excited about tomorrow because there's a passage, that, and what I love about studying the Bible is that you can study the Bible one way and think one thing and then study it a different way. Something came to me in preparation for this time that I'd never seen before that I'm convinced is going to help us in application tomorrow. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Where did you get the uh, statistic you quoted to us that 80%? Ah, so let me tell you what, um, and, and, I, and actually there was, and I think really, I think the number's more like 65%, but I've heard anywhere from 65% to 80% of the New Testament, either by its actual quotes or by what it's referring to, and it makes sense, is from the old, because what would they do? Create something new just out of the blue? Paul himself even says, now this is me, not the Lord. He's dealing with some specific issue. 
But you'll find over and over. Go to the book of James. I, I memorized the entire book of James. You know much of that? Uh, huh? Oh, here he comes. <laughs> He'll probably find the statistics. But I, th- I think it was like, I thought it was like 65%. But somewhere between that is that the percentage of either direct quotes. I'll give you an example. Hebrews, there's a quote that it's referring. You know, usually if you look in the New Testament, they will give you all capitals for an Old Testament quote. But there's an example where Hebrews is quoting Isaiah and changes one word so they don't put all capitals, but he's clearly quoting from Isaiah. So if you read through it, and when I love to do this, I especially love to read the red letters. When you're reading the red letters, you see over and over and over again that he's talking about something that's referring to the Torah. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Nothing else? Excellent. Yes, sir. Okay, so... I, I say this all the time. You cannot study words in Hebrew to understand idioms. If you just study words, I got to take this off of my ear. I will tell you one last thing, and that is just that um, the thing that I decided to do is that it wasn't, it wasn't good enough to take the approach that I learned in school. Like the school was just like word by word, but it really was reading passages. So that was for me that changed everything. Anything else? Huh? Percent of the Old Testament. 150% revelation. Wow. <laughs> I guarantee you that those numbers are even low because there are many verses or concepts that are Torah-based that are not called. All right, you guys, let's stand up. Give each other another hug and say thanks for coming tonight. See you tomorrow.